Hello, I'm Doug Sweetser, and I'm going to describe to a paper titled Polar Representations of Quaternions that's up at the visualphysics.org uh, preprint server. It's all of two pages, so hopefully I can't talk about it that long. Um, so, in some ways, this is like a trivial sort of thing because the polar representation of complex numbers is well understood. And with quaternions, what happens is instead of having just a factor of i, which is an imaginary number, there are actually three imaginary numbers, an i, a j, and a k, and if you substitute that for i, you get the same thing. So, why is this of any interest? Well, for me, it's because what I've done is taken what is an abstract thing and tried to make it very concrete. And I do that by thinking about events in space-time as a quaternion, because that has a time and it has a location, and that naturally fits into a quaternion which has a scalar and a three-vector. So, if you see an event happen somewhere in space-time, how are you going to describe it? Well, one way is the Euclidean approach. And what that supposes is that you have this infinite grid with rulers going through every point in space, or close enough, and clocks at those uh, points in space, so that all you have to do when an event happens is look at the local clock, look at the local uh, ruler. This idea was at the origin of special relativity because in the, around the 1900s people were very worried about trains crisscrossing Europe and making sure all the stations had exactly the same time. And it was that idea and some other ones that eventually led to special relativity. Well, there's another approach one could take. Let's say there's an event, and you could ask, well, what would it take to go from the origin to that event? How fast would you have to go? What direction would you have to go? And, like, <laughs> completely ignore the whole grid thing. That is what the polar representations are all about. So, there's this abstract notion of the origin. It can be anywhere, but uh, you got to choose one. You're free to choose. So the way I take this is that the origin should be where the observer is. And let me just take a me-centered universe. <laughs> you can do this yourself. And it's time zero, and I'm at location zero, zero, zero. And what happens to me as an observer is I stay at the same spatial location. I don't move. Um, but I do grow older. So I'm going to definitely go through the point one zero zero zero. Now let's say there's an event that happens. Then it's going to be in a different spatial location. It's going to be at a different time. And I can calculate how fast I got to go to get there. What direction I have to go to get there. Okay, so what's when this really gets interesting though is when we like animate everything. Okay? And so um, and think about like what circles would look like animated, what right triangles would look at like. Because when you do this polar analysis, you always have that unit circle and you have a right triangle inside it looks, uh, I guess, something a little bit like that. And, um, but now if you animate this thing, then it's kind of like doing a, a, a line scan where you go up like this and boom. So what's interesting about that is that you would start with nothing, then you'd see the circle first as two points that rush away from each other, get out to their maximum extent. At that point, you get to see the uh, two points appear at the origin 
one that never moves and one that moves away and then a little while later you get this uh, little blink going on and uh, then everything's gone. Now that's very different <laughs> from the, 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 the geometry they teach you uh, in school because with these things you come back uh, 16 years later they're, they're still you know carved into uh, a school desk um, but if you make everything dynamic you know in, in a second <laughs> poof it's gone um, so what happens with the uh, the observer is it just sits there and what happens with uh, I, I call it a beacon because it continually sends out uh, events um, it starts at the origin and then it moves away and it eventually will meet uh, up with that unit circle and um, that's another straight line the, the the circle actually is quite amazing because it, it uh, if you think about it in terms of how fast is it going half of the time it go it quote unquote goes faster than the speed of light now it doesn't it's a mathematical construction but the mathematical construction in a space-time diagram means that half the time it's got a slope that's you know more than 45 degrees which means that it's uh, formally speaking uh, going faster than the speed of light it's not really okay I'm not I'm just saying a mathematician did this they don't have to say a real particle does this circle thing no the math guy just says I'm I'm just doing this I'm not doing this with anything real I'm just uh, animating it all right so um, what's neat is that that b beacon that goes out and eventually meets the unit circle it's got a velocity it's got a constant velocity and its slope is 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 what that velocity is and so when you start doing the polar re representation of quaternions representing events in space-time you start dealing with velocities straight away it starts to really sound like physics right off the bat and I think that's why uh, the polar representation uh, should be of more interest uh, to more people and I hope you get a chance to check out this short paper thank you very much